And while the UK is hosting the COP26 climate summit, the government is also mulling a decision that critics say poses a serious setback to climate protection efforts and its credibility. The government's looking into granting permission for England's first new coal mine in over 30 years. DW's Birgit Maas reports now from Whitehaven in northern England on what is a potential nightmare for climate activists and for out-of-work miners, the hope of a new job. Mine shafts and pits. Could these soon be back in operation? There's a good chance they could be, says Dave Craddock. He was a miner for decades, and he loved his job. He was responsible for ventilation in all the coal pits in Whitehaven, a small town in northern England, including this one. That was the best job I ever had in my life. Miners look after themselves underground because it's such a dangerous occupation. When I came out of the mines, I didn't find that on the surface. Coal was last produced here in 1986. And then from there, that was the last coal mine in, in Cumbria. Now there are plans to start mining coal again for steel production. The seabed here is a veritable treasure trove. An estimated 750 million tonnes of coal lie under the water. If you want steel, you need coal. There's millions of tonnes of it out there on the job. Why bring it from abroad when you've got it here? Many British steelworks still use coal. There are new technologies which use hydrogen to power steel production or recycle old steel. And these are constantly being improved, but they have yet to replace coal. The council has already given the go-ahead for a new colliery on this former factory site. But climate activist Carol Wood and her husband Robin are campaigning against it. The climate change agenda is just so urgent now. I mean, we are actually seeing the impact of climate disaster. It's not, it's not in the future, it's happening now. And we haven't got any wriggle room. We absolutely need to keep this coal in the ground. This is the position of the new mine over on the marsh on site. And that's up where that light is on the top, just over there. Over there. But Dave you Craddock is enthusiastic light? about the new plans and reviving the many tunnels of the past. This map shows that mining was once everywhere. In the past, coal was shipped from here, but now there are just a few private boats. The old industries have died out, making the region one of the poorest in Britain. Many locals hope that the new mine will bring back jobs. I think they should let it happen and give more work out here because there's nothing. And it's a thriving town, but it's, it's going down now because, you know, there's no work. But as we're going to have to import it to replace the coal we've got in our country now, why would we not want to use what we've got until such time as we don't need it? That's taken on the Dave Craddock and his friend John Greasley are part of a group trying to rally more enthusiasm for the new mine. Who's in there? Let's have a look, John. They understand the misgivings of climate activists. Yeah. But they say that if coal a, is still needed, it's day. better to mine it locally. That would, that would be illegal, John. <laughs> I've seen how mining's done in America, where they'll strip a mountain top, extract the coal. They call it strip mining, and then just leave it and move on to another area. We're told all the time about food miles and why are we eating Argentinian beef and why are we eating Moroccan oranges. If it's important not to bring food across um, uh, a long distance, then it's even more important not to bring coal, especially in the quantities that the, uh, the European steel industry needs. But climate activists argue that each new coal mine puts more coal on the market and creates more emissions. The campaigners have managed to ensure that the government reviews the project again. We know there's disadvantage in this area and other parts of Cumbria that would benefit enormously from, from the investment in green jobs, you know, retrofitting houses, improving uh, insulation in the homes, uh, better transport provision um, and, uh, and green energy. You know, we've got a lovely windy environment here, so, we, you know, it's perfect for investment. So the battle goes on. 
between locals who hope for a return to the old times of high employment and others who want to move forward to a better, more environmentally friendly future. Well, world leaders are due to meet in Glasgow for a crucial UN climate change summit. Activists worldwide are calling on governments to make stronger commitments to deal with the catastrophic impacts of greenhouse gas emissions. Ahead of the COP26 meeting, the UN has issued a stark warning. It says the world is still on track for a catastrophic 2.7 degrees Celsius temperature rise within the next decade if urgent action isn't taken. And our correspondent Marina Strauss caught up with the EU's climate policy chief, Franz Timmermans, who will act as the bloc's chief negotiator in Glasgow. Here's what he had to say to DW News. Vice President, the EU is often praised as one of the leaders when it comes to climate action, but there are also critics, for example, the European Parliament, who says uh, we need more climate actions and we have to have even higher goals. So why is the EU not more ambitious? I think we're the most ambitious in the world. Uh, and I think we have, uh, as we're the only ones, have a really clear path to get us from here to climate neutrality in 2050. So I think we can be proud of that. It's now my task to make sure that we actually put this into legislation that is adopted by Parliament and Council. Many see the upcoming climate summit in Glasgow, COP26, as the make or break chance to finally tackle climate action in the world. But some leaders of the biggest emitting countries, for example, Russia and China, won't even be there in person. So how can this possibly be a success? I think this is the most important COP since Paris. So we have an obligation to make it a successful meeting. Um, of course, it would have been better to have everybody there present, but what is more important than the presence of the leaders is their commitment uh, to uh, the, uh, tackling the climate crisis, their commitment to reducing their emissions. And all these leaders have made um, relatively bold statements in the last couple of months. The UN released a report only this week saying if we keep emitting as we do now, um, we might see a warming of 2.7 degrees Celsius in the future. And this is actually looking at the plans that the countries submitted for COP26. So how can this possibly a, a be a success if there are only these plans that lead to this uh, result? Well, if we had not changed our policies, the temperature increase would be beyond 4 degrees. So on the basis of the policies we have now, it's going to be 2.7. That is not Paris territory, so we're not am ambitious enough. So uh, at, at COP, we need to try and find a consensus that will take us to a situation where we stay well below two degrees. So the UN report is important because it tells us that with all the efforts that have been undertaken now, these are not enough. Developed countries um, have pledged to uh, help um, like the developing world with $100 billion per year, but they have failed and the EU has failed as well to help these countries. So are we leaving poorer countries behind when it comes to climate change? We will be reaching the $100 billion around 2023. I would have liked to see uh, that this happen earlier, but we will get there. And I think the EU has not failed. The EU is one of the major contributors to the financing, even beyond the percentage we have in the world economy. So the EU is the ally of the developing world. And I have to be very, very clear. If we are not able to provide that financing, we cannot, in all earnest, uh, ask of developing countries to do more. They need to be able to adapt and uh, to mitigate uh, their emissions, but especially to adapt to these new conditions. And they can't afford to pay for that all themselves. Thank you very much. Pleasure.